Welcome to the Gettysburg National Military Park, the most visited battlefield in the nation. Today, you and I will be on opposite sides of a fascinating war game where we will refight all three days of the Battle of Gettysburg. I'm Gary Edelman with the American Battlefield Trust, professional historian and licensed battlefield guide at Gettysburg. I'm Greg Wagman from Little Wars TV. I am an amateur historian, also known as a military history buff and a wargaming expert. Now, Greg, should I be a little bit nervous fighting against a wargaming veteran here? Well, you won't be fighting alone. My club of history buffs and wargaming pros will be challenging you and two other professional historians in this epic battle. We'll match wits on a giant replica battlefield made just for this event. But this is no ordinary war game. A month before playing today's game, we invited you, our audience, to take command. On the American Battlefield Trust Facebook page, we offered you the opportunity to play the role of an armchair general and vote on three critical strategic decisions for each army. The players in our game will follow your orders, and we'll see if we can rewrite history. Who will win this rematch of the Battle of Gettysburg, the professional historian or the professional war gamers? Watch to find out. I'm Greg, and today I will be playing the role of General Robert E. Lee, commanding. Morning, everyone. I'm Tony. I'm going to be playing the part of A.P. Hill in today's Battle of Gettysburg. Hi, I'm Tom. I'll be playing Lieutenant General James Longstreet in today's Battle of Gettysburg. I'm Steve, and today I will be General Richard Yule. I'm Gary Edelman, Director of History and Education at the American Battlefield Trust. I am honored to be playing General Meade today, and I'll be in charge of the 5th and 6th Corps as well. I'm Dan Davis, Education Associate at the American Battlefield Trust, and today I'll be playing Major General John Reynolds. I'll be commanding the 1st Corps and the 11th Corps. I'm Dr. Darrell Black, the Executive Director of Seminary Ridge Museum, and today I am Winfield Hancock. I have command of the 2nd, 3rd, and 12th Corps. The interactive war game you're about to witness was played on an 8 foot by 6 foot tabletop, handmade for this anniversary event. The scale of the table is 1 inch to 100 yards, based on the famous 1868 Warren map, drafted by the chief engineer of the Union Army at Gettysburg. To play a war game at this scale, thousands of hand painted 6 millimeter miniatures compose the two armies. A single base of miniatures represents an entire brigade averaging 1,500 men at Gettysburg. The Confederate Army of Northern Virginia is organized into three infantry corps, totaling almost 75,000 men and 250 pieces of artillery. The Union Army of the Potomac is over 90,000 men and 350 pieces of artillery, divided into seven smaller infantry corps. The Federal Vanguard also includes a division of 3,000 cavalry. Today's game will be played on Seminary Ridge, inside the building known as the Lee Headquarters. In truth, General Lee always preferred his field tent and used this house briefly on the first day of the battle. Before we take you inside to start the game, the players need some marching orders. Our war game begins at 9 a.m. on July 1st with Henry Heath's Confederates engaged with John Buford's cavalry on the ridges right behind us. And this is the site of our first command decision for each army. John Reynolds arrives with the Union First Corps and faces a critical decision. Does he answer Buford's call for aid at McPherson's Ridge or order Buford to fall back and join him on the high ground of Cemetery Hill? 61% of you voted to order Buford to conduct a fighting withdrawal toward the heights south of town on Cemetery Hill. This is very interesting because originally the Union First Corps under Reynolds and the 11th Corps under Howard came out and suffered heavy casualties for which Reynolds paid with his life. Around this same time, a few miles to the west, Robert E. Lee faces a decision of his own when he learns that Heath has brought about a general engagement against a strong unidentified Yankee force. Should Lee order the rest of A.P. Hill's corps forward to press the attack, or pull back to Hare Ridge and wait for Yule's corps to reach the field from the north? You voted, and 60% of you ordered Hill's corps to press the attack without waiting for Yule's support. Let's get back to the war game and pass along your orders to the players. I've deployed Buford's cavalry brigades to the west of Gettysburg, covering the ridge lines 
out beyond the town. But unfortunately, I don't have the supporting infantry coming up. I'm not buying time for that infantry. So I'm going to have to hold on to those ridge lines for as long as possible against the Confederates. My plan. Heath's division has seen some Union cavalry behind it. It appears Union infantry, possibly Reynolds Corps, moving into the vicinity of the town. I'm going to bring up Anderson's division, drive aggressively through the Union cavalry, push them into the Union infantry, and move for the small hills on the other side of the town. General Hill wastes no time implementing his orders, rushing forward as second division to support Heath and punch through the Federal cavalry screen on the ridges. A heavy column of determined Confederate infantry easily drives Buford's troopers from McPherson's Ridge. Securing the next ridge line, Seminary Ridge, proves a more difficult task. Heath's initial attack is repulsed, and a second attempt only serves to scatter the Federal cavalry, not destroy them. Buford cleverly evades the heaviest fight, slipping his troopers down Seminary Ridge to the south. Hill's men may have taken the ridges west of town, but they must now decide whether to press into Gettysburg or deal with the Federal cavalry lurking on their southern flank. General Hill opts to divide his forces, sending Heath's division to pursue the cavalry, while Anderson's fresh troops descend on Gettysburg. General Reynolds has not been idle in the mid-morning hours, quite the contrary. With Buford buying time on the ridges, Reynolds faithfully follows his orders to entrench his first corps on the slopes of Cemetery Hill. His divisions are represented by these flag markers instead of miniatures because they have not yet been spotted by the Confederate infantry. That's about to change. A.P. Hill establishes his headquarters in the Lutheran Theological Seminary, and as he watches one of his divisions march into Gettysburg uncontested, he also spies Federal infantry digging in on the heights south of town. But now, he can also see another Union Corps arriving in the far distance. This brings us to your second command decision. It's mid-morning on the first day's action and we've reached our second command decision. 11th Corps Commander Howard is moving up toward Gettysburg with his corps. There are unconfirmed reports that rebel troops may be approaching the town from the north, but still no sign of them. Should Howard be ordered to take up defensive positions around Gettysburg in case this threat materializes, or should his fresh corps deploy for attack and help Reynolds and the First Corps overwhelm A.P. Hill's Confederates west of town? You voted, and an overwhelming 67% of you counseled caution, ordering Howard to take up defensive positions south of Gettysburg. Caution may have been a wise decision because not long after Howard's men reached the field, leading elements of Yule's 2nd Corps appear right here on Oak Ridge. And from this vantage point, looking out onto the terrain behind us, Yule can see some desirable high ground beyond the town. Should General Yule be ordered to drive against the Federal right and carry Culp's or Cemetery Hill, or should Lee direct Yule and Hill to swing west and turn the Federal left, threatening their rear line of communication? This was apparently a tough decision, but 53% of you ordered Yule to attempt to carry Cemetery and Culp's Hill. Let's get back to the game and let our players know the orders. I like the orders of having Howard coming up and staying south of Gettysburg. The first corps is digging in on Cemetery Hill. I'm going to push up Howard, join into their right. Meanwhile, Buford is holding his own on the ridges outside of town. John Buford is doing more than holding his own along Seminary Ridge. His evasive tactics are successful in drawing off Heath's 7,000 Confederate infantry, teasing them with a wild goose chase down the ridgeline. With A.P. Hill eager to test the Union defenses on the lower slope of Cemetery Ridge, he can ill afford this meddlesome distraction. But fortunately for Hill, General Richard Ewell's Second Corps appears on the field north of town. I have just arrived on the board with Rhodes and Early's division. Uh, I intend to pressure those, uh, those people who are over to the east of the city from their flank, unless I receive orders otherwise. Your orders, sir. I apparently am going to refocus my attack on the high ground just to the southwest of town. I will do my best and take those hills if practicable. Historically, Ewell's advance was contested, but the command decisions you voted on left the entire field north of Gettysburg undefended. 
This allows Yule's divisions an easy march into town, where they begin angling toward Culp's Hill. Howard and the 11th Corps are already waiting for them along the wooded slopes. In the late afternoon, the battle intensifies. Divisions under Hill and Yule stream through Gettysburg and charge up the slopes of Cemetery and Culp's Hill. General Reynolds sends word back to Meade and Hancock that his line is holding firm. In the Confederate camp, General Yule confers with Lee to request revised instructions, but the final decision is not up to the players. It's a command decision for you. For our third command decision, we're here at the little house near where Lee had his headquarters on Seminary Ridge. And one major, major advantage Robert E. Lee had over the Union Army is that he was here within hours of when the battle erupted. General Meade is still many miles distant. But by midday, Meade was fully aware that his trusted lieutenant, John Reynolds, had committed the army to a major action at Gettysburg. Meade knows that Dan Sickles and the Union Third Corps are within marching distance of the fight, but just barely. Should Sickles be ordered to double-time his men to the battle? Battle, knowing they'll arrive worn out and exhausted? Or will you order Sickles to Gettysburg at a more orderly pace, knowing they may not make it before dusk? This was a razor-thin margin, the narrowest of the entire poll, but 50.2% of you agreed that getting exhausted troops to the battlefield quicker was more important than having Sickles arrive fresh on the battlefield. Let's see how that pays off. Not long after Meade faces this choice, Lee is at his headquarters receiving reports from Hill and Yule that their divisions are losing cohesion and may be in need of reorganization. But with the sun sinking lower on the horizon, should Lee press the attack despite the condition of his men? You voted, and it was another very close result. By a margin of 51 to 49, you ordered Hill and Yule to assume defensive positions and not to attack at dusk on July 1st. <laughs> That's a very interesting decision, so let's go back to the battlefield and see what happens. The uh, decision to bring Sickles Corps up uh, from Emmitsburg on a forced march was a really good one. In fact, I think I actually voted for that move uh, a few weeks back, so uh, I'm pretty pleased. It's very nice to have Sickles troops on the field before it gets dark. I, I do not understand my orders. Initially, I was ordered to attack aggressively, and I've done so, and now I'm told to assume a defensive posture. I I'm not sure I understand. General Hill, I believe we are seeing the results of democracy in action. Well, the situation is very confused. <laughs> yes. I, I think based on where my divisions are, at least early in Rhodes, I can still approach those hills. Mm -hmm. I will simply not attack any entrenchments that appear in front of me. General Hill? I believe I'm going to reform my lines and I'm going to follow his lead. I'm going to move, get into an attack position for the morning. While the Confederates reorder their lines and await the arrival of Longstreet's Corps, the Federal commanders confer on the proper use of Sickles and his exhausted, newly arrived Third Corps. Fittingly, he is directed, where else? To the Peach Orchard. With daylight expiring on July 1st, Sickles and his men occupy high ground that threatens Lee's southern flank. How will the Confederates respond? At this critical moment in the game, the American Battlefield Trust took to Facebook with a live video stream, offering fans one last command decision, broadcast live from the tabletop in real time. For the Union Army, voters were asked whether to send Meade's reinforcements, the Fifth Corps under Sykes, to bolster their exposed flank at Wolf Hill, or to order Sykes to his historical position in reserve behind Little Round Top. For the Confederate Army, you were asked where to direct Longstreet's attack on July 2nd. Should he take his historical route south and smash through Sickles' isolated position at the Peach Orchard, or rewrite history by swinging around the Union right flank beyond Culp's Hill? As Meade and Lee, Gary and Greg present these options to viewers, and thousands of you tuned in for the Facebook live stream. Voting remained open for 30 minutes while the players in the game retired to await the final results and discuss their own battle plans. At Meade's War Council, the players hope the voters will send Sykes toward Sickles, where they see a tantalizing opportunity to attack. We also have a possibility, perhaps, to sweep up and take the Confederates on the right, depending on what the viewers uh, decide. If we can get Sykes over to our left flank, we can uh, use Sykes and Sickles to roll up their right flank. And even if we can't bring Sykes over, we can bring the 12th Corps or the remaining elements of the 11th into an attack like this across the center, rolling up the flank. Of course, the outcome that I am hoping for is that the voters will choose 
for the Confederates to swing right, as we did historically. And I know that that didn't turn out well for us historically, <laughs> but if you're taking a look at the ground here, Wolf Hill is just a nasty, nasty position. I do not want to get bogged down over there. So what are we thinking we might be doing if we can shift down to the right General Hill? While the Confederate generals draw up their grand design for July 2nd, the American Battlefield Trust finishes tallying the votes for the last command decision. Both sides are about to be rudely surprised with the result. The Army of the Potomac receives orders to send Sykes north to Wolf Hill, depriving the Federals the opportunity to try rolling up Lee's southern flank. General Meade takes his new orders in stride and remains confident going into July 2nd. You know, we are, you know, sort of having an advantage in the actual battle. The Union got bloody on the first day, terribly blooded. We withstood the first day very well. So uh, it's very interesting to see this uh, playing out. And it's interesting watching the sun sort of go down so your forces can reach the field. All right. So General McClaws has come on to the field of battle. And I have been informed that our, our viewers have decided that Longstreet's corps should move to his left instead of the historic right towards the little round tops. General Hood is very perplexed by this. He told me all day he wanted to go to the right and we are not gonna be allowed to do that. So I, I think this puts us in a situation where it'll take uh, perhaps until the 3rd of July for me to get forces in place. Uh, my forces are moving up from Chambersburg and it will certainly delay our action here, but we will make the best of it. With Longstreet's Corps just now reaching the field, Ewell and Hill plot a coordinated assault against the Union entrenchments on Cemetery Hill in the early morning. Reynolds has his first line of defense at the foot of the hill, with both flanks in the air. The Confederates take full advantage of that deployment and crash inward from both sides. So you have a total of six. Get a six, man. Three. Give them the cold steel. Losing unit recoils three base steps and is fatigued. Victor advances one or two. Um, so he's gonna go. The Federals flee back to higher ground with heavy losses. Fortunately for Meade, Hancock's Second Corps is forming a reserve in the rear, ready to be sent where needed. And it's not a moment too soon, because the Confederates are lining up for a second coordinated drive against Cemetery Hill. But at this critical moment on the morning of July 2nd, A.P. Hill falls victim to one of his bouts of debilitating illness. The rules being used for today's war game take into account the personalities and quirks of each general, and historically, A.P. Hill did suffer from a variety of ailments during his career. Disastrous timing. First, Longstreet is ordered to move to the left flank rather than the right flank as we had hoped, and now A.P. Hill, because he's somewhat sickly at this battle, is taking the moment to be completely inert and has issued no orders to his troops. And as a result, Hill's Corps is stalled just at the moment we're trying to launch an attack. Um, things have, couldn't possibly get any more precarious at this moment. With Hill inactive, Longstreet marching, and Ewell flailing against Culp's and Cemetery Hill, the Confederate battle plan seems to be falling apart by midday. This does not escape Meade's attention, and he orders Sickles to advance from the Peach Orchard while Sykes maneuvers through Wolf's Hill against the opposite rebel flank. Unlike the historical battle, Meade and the Army of the Potomac are now on the attack, pressuring both flanks. At the northern end of the operation, General Sykes and his men find the dense woods and slopes of Wolf's Hill to be rugged, slow marching. They're destined to lose most of the afternoon struggling through the woods. At the southern end of the battlefield, Sickles hits the end of the Confederate line only to be repulsed by Heath's division near the Kadori farm. To support Sickles, Meade orders Hancock's corps to advance and plug the hole in the Union line. By now, it's mid-afternoon, and the Federal Army doesn't know A.P. Hill's health has recovered. General Lee orders a newly invigorated Hill to coordinate with Ewell and leading elements of Longstreet's Corps for a determined attack on West Cemetery Hill. Over 25,000 Confederate troops massed in four divisions step off to deliver what Lee hopes could be the knockout blow. 
Well, General Yule, I believe we finally reached a moment of decision. We've launched a broad attack. Hopefully we can accomplish something and drive the Yankees back from the hills. And we must do it immediately because yes. there are Union troops that have appeared on my flank. And while General Early is doing his best to hold them off, I fear he will not be able to do so for very long. So we must push this attack. We must push those people off those hills. The Confederates are attacking. Unlike in the battle, they are attacking West Cemetery Hill and the Emmitsburg Road on July 2nd. It is an intense attack, but we are weathering it very well. We have a defense in depth. I'm not worried for our Union forces. In fact, we plan to counterattack before long after we repel the rebel host. Meade's confidence in his defensive position is now put to the test. 100 Confederate cannon open fire on Cemetery Hill followed by 28,000 infantry attacking across a mile and a half front. The Union line staggers under the weight of the assault, and John Reynolds heroically rides into the breach to keep his corps in line. In a cruel bit of historical irony, at this decisive moment, Reynolds is killed in the saddle, one day after he died historically. Oh! <laughs> You should have let me roll. <laughs> Reynolds has died. Okay, so General Reynolds, Reynolds saddle. Remove him from play. Oh my God! Poor, poor sap. Poor the... General Reynolds. John Reynolds breathing his last. Turn. Reynolds has outlived his expected life. The death of Reynolds triggers a panic on Cemetery Hill, and suddenly two Federal corps retreat south down the ridge. From atop Cemetery Hill, I can see Confederate flags moving up through the smoke and a courier has just arrived at my headquarters. General Reynolds has fallen. Day late, but still got him. All of the momentum may be in Lee's hands, but the sun is low on the horizon when the breakthrough at Cemetery Hill occurs. Divisions under Longstreet, Ewell, and Hill are badly mixed up from the swirling melee, and the evening hours must be spent reorganizing the men. As dusk approaches on July 2nd, Meade senses that Lee's efforts in the center may have left his flanks weakened and unleashes a counterattack. Well, we've been hovering off the flank, the southern flank of the Confederate line with Sickles Corps uh, and decided to finally uh, move forward uh, in coordination with some of the Second Corps in an attempt to begin to roll the uh, Confederate flank up. Uh, from south to north uh, and to perhaps uh, create a, a significant breakthrough. Hancock launches a pinning attack across Cemetery Ridge, while Sickles slips his third corps behind Hill's southern flank. But rather than make an orderly retreat, Hill brings up Pender's division to do the opposite. General Hancock is stunned to find the Confederates meeting his advance with a countercharge. Recklessly exposing himself to danger, A.P. Hill personally leads the attack. Hancock's advance now turns into an unexpected retreat back across Cemetery Ridge. But farther to the north, the other wing of the planned federal flanking effort shows more promise. Sykes and the hard-marching Fifth Corps finally emerge from the woods to hit the end of Ewell's line. Only darkness saves Early's division. On the night of July 2nd, both armies have plenty to consider. The two teams retire to draw up their battle plans for the third and final day. We are in possession of the ground we want to be in possession of, and we got some good advice from one of our aides de camp who said something like, Yeah, we fought well today, but we were told to fall the F back. Okay, and I think we might <laughs> follow some of that advice. However, continue to exploit the flanks. That's been working well. It's been forcing them to redeploy. So we will consolidate our lines, use our natural strength in depth, and watch them bloody themselves against our forces. The situation has improved remarkably. Hard fighting. Hard, hard fighting, fighting, and all three corps were involved in achieving a critical breakthrough, we are actually on Cemetery Hill right now. I must say, however, my, my boys have suffered grievously this day and are almost spent. Put some ointment on your boys so we're <laughs> sick of hearing about a, a grievous confliction. After being directed to the left by our citizen generals, <laughs> I'm now moving to the right up Cemetery Hill and trying to take advantage of the gains we made on the second day. As, as annoyed as I was with the outcome of that fan <laughs> vote, <laughs> to send you to the left flank over at Wolf Hill, I have to say, given the breakthrough that we achieved, you are now actually in an excellent position with fresh divisions, fresh divisions. to move up and blow through that hole. To victory. To picket. <laughs> <laughs>
As the sun rises on July 3rd, the battlefield looks very different on the Federal side. Meade's army pulled back overnight, and the new Union line presents a compact, deep formation standing between Lee and the road to Washington. Undaunted, Lee orders his corps commanders to press onward. The rebel yell goes up as the morning attack focuses on the Federal center. Longstreet's corps leads the attack, sweeping down from Cemetery Hill toward Powers Hill. In the swirl of battle, General Sykes is killed and his 5th Corps men begin to waver. Longstreet calls up his reserves to try and break open the Federal line. General Pickett has been notified to proceed immediately to the front at Cemetery Hill. Attacking on Echelon next to Longstreet, A.P. Hill's Corps opens up with 60 pieces of artillery before Heath's division steps off to attack. Hill once again tempts fate by leading from the front, pushing across Cemetery Ridge and coming face to face with his old adversary, Hancock. When the smoke clears, it's Hancock and not Hill who is hit. Grievously wounded, Hancock is carried to the rear and the Second Corps begins to give way. By noon on July 3rd, Meade is down two Corps commanders and feeling the pressure in the center. In this hour of crisis, Meade calls upon Dan Sickles and the 3rd Corps to make a spoiling attack from the Peach Orchard. Without hesitation, Sickles aggressively launches his small divisions into the maelstrom, pressuring Hill's flank and forcing valuable Confederate manpower to be shifted to blunt the attack. By this time, Lee receives report that Ewell's Corps is fought to exhaustion. Only Longstreet has a single fresh division to commit to the fight, while the Federal Army is being bolstered by an entire fresh corps under Sedgwick. Unwilling to commit to another pointless picket's charge 156 years later, today's General Lee elects to withdraw west in good order, conceding the battlefield. At best, this has been a bloody tactical success for the Army of Northern Virginia, suffering almost 20,000 casualties while inflicting nearly 30,000 losses on the Federal Army, which also lost Generals Reynolds, Sykes, and Hancock. But strategically, Meade has held the rebels at bay and the road to Washington remains secure. Lee retires back to the Blue Ridge Mountains, still lacking a decisive victory on Northern soil. General, well played. 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 <laughs> Indeed, gentlemen. Well, I am afraid that it is 5 o'clock on July 3rd, 1863, and just like 156 years ago, we have failed to break the Union lines. Well, I am very proud. I'm sorry, I should speak in Yankee talk. Uh, <laughs> I'm really proud of the way my troops performed, guys. It, it was a very close battle. I, I didn't think it was going to be at the end of July 1. No. <laughs> but by the time we made it to July 3, we had taken Cemetery Hill. We just weren't able to push much farther beyond. One might say that your dander was up. Not up enough. <laughs> <laughs> An interesting takeaway I had from this game is that, you know, people when they talk about the battle do like to say, well, you know, if only the Confederates had taken Cemetery Hill, it would have been different. Well, right. we did. <laughs> we took Cemetery Hill. We were in sole possession of that hill by the end of the day. And the reality is, just because you have Cemetery Hill doesn't mean you have Washington. There's still That's, a lot of Yankees to get through. Yep. There was a lot of ground between Cemetery Hill and Rock Creek. and uh, Yeah, there was still a lot of blue between us and, and Lincoln. So... We did our best, and you, the viewers, I believe, have failed us today <laughs> with, with your orders. You should have voted to have us go to the right. <laughs> to the right. To the, the whole, right. The whole war is about rights. <laughs> The battle is over, and man, did we learn a lot. It was very instructive and fun as well, Dan. I think the most instructive thing about uh, this game is just actually seeing how many men the Federals had here at their disposal yeah. on the field. That gave me a different uh, context to this battle. Yeah, watching the, 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 the reinforcements coming onto the field was very instructive. Mm -hmm. and thinking about it and, and the phases, and every time it seems like the Confederates have a little bit of an advantage, a little bit of momentum going, there's a major influx of bodies 
Union bodies on the battlefield. Yeah, here and comes another division. Another, here's another division, here's another corps. Playing the role of General Meade and then the 5th and 6th Corps, uh, the last to arrive for the Union, I kept on worrying about what's going on here. I need not have worried because we had capable people out front. The 1st and the 11th Corps and Buford's division were able to hold really well. The 3rd Corps came and marched hard to get to the field. And once the old 2nd Corps arrived, they didn't exactly fight as well they as they did in the well. Civil War. No, but once no. they arrived, I felt really good. And then we could really use the 5th and 6th yeah. Corps as a mobile reserve. And so we did. Well, believe Believe it or not, the third corps anchors the entire Union line in the in the in the in the peach orchard. Yes, it was in, really interesting. In Pitcher's Woods. And so but, yes, Dan Sickles was the hero. Of he me. was the hero <laughs> because he went to, because he marched to the peach orchard. So let's say it that what he said was true. This whole damn battlefield is my monument, said Dan Sickles.